This morning we have an interesting subject, which probably is not as generally known as might be desirable. In antiquity, the first sciences to be developed were mathematics, astronomy, and music. In various ways, in various degrees, in various modes, these ancient forms have been disseminated throughout the entire world. From the most primitive people to the most exalted, psalms, rhythms, and various artistic pursuits have developed and gradually risen to the degree of fine art and classical music. It, math mathematics was the beginning of it all. And the mathematical symbols, as developed by the Pythagoreans, probably derived from India, was the science of organization. It made possible a classification, an integration, of all of the different forms of phenomena in nature. Mathematics enabled us to get the problem of time, to uh, find locations, uh, to add up various problems and formulas indispensable to the advancement of science and equally indispensable to the advancement of economics. So mathematics was really a wonderful development. We do not know who actually originated it or the first great mathematician, but we suspect it may have been developed either in India or ancient uh, Egypt. In any event, mathematics was a science of exactitudes. It lifted things out of doubt and generality and resulted in a formation or a formularization of knowledge which has continued to support our various activities from a very remote time. Now astronomy was not possible until mathematics came along. And mathematics took the universal system that we see around us and began the gradual organization of it. That is, it did nothing to change the system but to organize our concept of the system. It began to reveal to us the really wonderful universe in which we lived. It's gradually revealed to us that things were not accidental, that there were laws and rules governing practically every procedure and function of the universe. The combination, therefore, of mathematics and astronomy added together formed what has been called astrotheology. That is, religion based upon the supporting evidence of nature. In other words, it was possible to decide certain values, moral and otherwise, because of their symbolic place in the natural world around us. We began to realize, for instance, the very simple fact that there aren't many accidents in the, in the functions of universal law. We began to realize the effects that follow causes, and also the timing of cycles. We began to develop the theory of protecting agriculture through, the know, through knowing the seasons and uh, all the different forms of planting and reaping came to our attention and were integrated into a pattern. It all added up to one simple fact. We were living in a wonderful universe ruled by something. Now what it was ruled by was still a little dim because the physical form of the universe uh, seemed to be all that we could find out about it. But gradually there came to the realization of these people that the physical universe was a symbol, that the processes which exist and make the universe a symbol are invisible. And gradually out of the contemplation of visible things, we began to recognize the need for invisible forces behind these things. We could see bodies, but we couldn't see the life in them. But we could find out something about it by watching its effects in the material world. We could not control completely our integration of the vastness of the universe, but we were able to gradually create a series of laws by which we could obey the simple phenomena of life. And out of this uh, research, this thoughtfulness of primitive people, we have the moral code. The moral code is based firmly upon universal laws, laws that men never quite understood fully, but the results of which came to their attention every day until finally they were forced to accept the causes 
because there was no other way of explaining the effects. So little by little, knowledge increased. And then there came a quite an interesting division in this problem. Namely, knowledge considered on the one hand as beneficial and knowledge on the other hand as dangerous. It became obvious that knowledge brought with it power. And it is also an, a fact that was known to very ancient people that power is temptation and power can lead to most of the disasters which can occur to the human being. Therefore, knowledge without ethics, skills without integration of consciousness, the individual operating in the material universe without sensing the responsibilities which are involved in existence was a danger and a menace to the rest of society. There was no way of once withdrawing knowledge that had been given. Once the knowledge was available, nothing could put it back again into secrecy. The only answer to this problem was to keep it secret from the beginning. Now, the problem of secrecy was largely in the hands of a philosophical priesthood, or perhaps we might say a great theological structure. This structure was dedicated to non-profit. These uh, teachers and philosophers were dedicated to the service of humanity and uh, were free from all the temptations of personal aggrandizement. These, in turn, decided to censor knowledge so that it might be safely communicated. Knowledge that could not be communicated would die with the original owner. Therefore, there had to be a way of handing down knowledge from one generation to another. And as time went on, it had to spread from one nation to another until it finally reached the circumference of the entire planet. So to do this successfully, there was something had to be done to protect those forms of knowledge which by exploitation could become a menace to the survival of peoples. This story is more or less also unfolded in the uh, platonic account of the destruction of Atlantis. In, in Atlantis, skill became greater than morality. Power took over. Ethics were, was compromised. And finally, the entire uh, continent destroyed itself. The misuse of knowledge must end in tragedy, must, es must end in disaster. And if this disaster is not curbed in some way, it could topple over our civilization. So the ancients decided the one way was to put certain restrictions upon the dissemination of knowledge. These, uh, these restrictions uh, added up together formed a kind of system of instruction which came to be known as the mysteries. These mysteries were schools, universities, colleges, dedicated to the preservation and dissemination of knowledge under direction and control. The individual who desired knowledge and re recognized the need of it was placed under certain restrictions, must take obligations, must prove through long training and discipline worthiness to receive knowledge. It was the purpose of these ancient teachers to make sure that nothing important to the advancement of man could be captured and held by selfishness or ambition or avarice. It was necessary, therefore, to select the custodians of knowledge. For this reason, we find most of the ancient teachers had schools or systems by which they communicated knowledge. The school of Pythagoras at Crotona was one of the most famous of the ancient world. The school of Plato at Athens was another. And in the far distances of Asia, we find the old gurus with their disciples uh, studying the mysteries of life under leadership and under discipline. As time went on, of course, met much of this knowledge gradually crept into public domain. The old institutions faded away under the pressure of changing beliefs and policies. Uh, ambitious individuals without knowledge or skill were able to gradually attract and gather around themselves armies and systems of followers 
and these began to attack and destroy the great institutions of learning. In other words, the great protection was the wisdom of the few, and in order that the many could control, this wisdom had to be curtailed or stamped out in some way. The mystery system fell under considerable pressure, but it never entirely ceased. And even today there are evidences that they, of the perpetuation of this system of rulership and protection. So now we go back again to the problem that we started with, and that is uh, mathematics and astronomy. Astronomy has passed through a great many different levels of insights and interpretations. Astronomy was originally uh, the science of, of the anatomy and physiology and function of the solar system. It had to do with every process in which the natural laws of existence went into obvious operation within the consciousness of that part of life which man could comprehend. So the problem was to gradually discover some way of transforming a skeletal system to the, become the basis of a great theological mystery. The result was astrotheology which was probably the first organization of man's religious beliefs. This organization was firmly established in mathematics and astronomy. And uh, the graces which assisted under the heading of music and art have always been part of classical religions. All of these religious systems, therefore, uh, became gradually integrated around astronomy, mathematics and music. Uh, those who wish to enter the school of Pythagoras must first pass an examination in these three sciences, for to the ancients music was also a science. Any of the other teachers who came along or were in other parts of the world put similar restraints upon the communication of knowledge. They had to test the individual as to whether he was truly worthy on the grounds that he, the, no, the more he knew, the more he could pervert knowledge. If he was selfish, he could use it to destroy or offend or disintegrate the society to which he belonged. It also would provide him with the ambitions which might lead him to conquest, war, and many great disasters. So the uh, ancients had these testings. Now Homer, in... Uh, a section of his writings called the Cave of the Nymphs, describes the initiation rituals of the ancient astrotheology. And uh, we first point out and notice that the, ev the one great religious, astronomical, mathematical day was New Year's, the winter solstice. This was the beginning of the year for antiquity. It at the beginning of the year, this solstice point was of the greatest and most basic importance. Well, I think we must also realize in studying this that practically every religion and esoteric system we have in the world today developed in the northern hemisphere. And all of the calculations that are made are based upon the precession of the equinoxes and, of course, the solar system of the year on uh, the or in the area of the northern hemisphere. Uh, at that time, uh, we find the zodiac already fairly well known. We find that most of the symbols found in religion were also to be found in astronomy. We realize, for example, uh, that the 72 elders of Israel were the five-degree divisions of the circle of the zodiac. We know that the twelve signs became twelve apostles, twelve disciples, twelve leaders, and also that the course of time were associated with twelve major religious revelations. We find that almost every unit that has to, has to do with man's survival is in some way mathematically te keyed to the zodiac. Now, in the old time, and even later in the mystical writings of Jacob Benny, the arrangement of the zodiac is slightly different.
from what we generally use in astronomy or astrology today. We still begin, technically, the zodiac with the sign of Aries. But whereas we usually think of this as placed on the eastern angle of a horoscope, in the ancient times the sign of Aries was placed in the midheaven. In other words, it was at the highest point, and that that was the point of the, we might say, the beginning of the year, the New Year's ceremony usually occurring between the 20th and the 25th or 27th of December. At this time, the sun was born again. It rose from the dead of the old year. It began to move northward, and in moving northward, with its own strange power, began to release the life locked in the earth. So the ancients considered the sun as the principal symbol of deity. No ancient person of wisdom or insight ever thought of the sun as that being, but rather the mirror of it. To the Greeks, the uh, sun god carried a shield, and this shield was the mirror of the sun. It was not the sun, but the sun was there as a symbol of order, life, resurrection, fertility, and uh, inwardly, of the illumination of the soul. Therefore, the sun became a object of worship everywhere. In Egypt, for instance, in the course of the development of the doctrine of Akhenaten, uh, the great reformer of Egyptian mysticism, the Aton, or sun, was the supreme symbol. This symbol uh, in the Egyptian was a ball of light surrounded by radiant rays, each of the rays ending in the symbol of the human hand. Therefore, the sun was radiating in all directions, lifting up everything that came in contact with, bringing death to life out of the earth. Now, this uh, seemed to be very interesting to most ancient people. It helped them to understand something about life, which otherwise was too difficult for them. The sun also, whether we realize it or not, became a symbol of deity in early Christianity. It was definitely associated with the nimbus, the halo, and the radiance around the heads of saints. It was the symbol of spiritual light manifesting through the physical light of nature. The sun as a spiritual power brought enlightenment to the inner life. Uh, releasing the individual from ignorance, superstition, and fear. In the outer world, the sun was the generator of life and the regenerator of everything that man depended on for survival. Without the light of the sun, he could not live. Also, therefore, that part of the, of the world where the sun was above the horizon was the good part, the life part. Night was the dark part. Night was darkness, mystery, and death. Day was light, brightness, and wisdom. So that the uh, life of the individual was gradually divided into these two hemispheres, the hemisphere of light and the hemisphere of darkness. Light became the symbol of growth and hope and wisdom. Darkness was a groping. Therefore, darkness became an appropriate symbol of ignorance. That which was ignorant lived in darkness. That which was wise lived in light. Now, how did the ancients understand ignorance? To the common people, ignorance was lack of formal education. To the priests of the mystery, uh, ignorance was the lack of internal realization of good. Therefore, all of the changes that take place in the world, in the seasons and in the ages, in the great processional of the, of the equinoxes, all these things had their equivalent within the person himself. He had his solstices and his uh, equinoxes. He had all of the different planets of the system. He had all the different zones and spheres and degree, degrees of the zodiac within his own constitution. And out of this came the great symbol of the grand man of the universe. This was uh, very strongly emphasized in the Kabbalah and also in the early rites of the Rosicrucians and other mystical associations in Europe. So to find that the universe was the great man and that man was the little universe, 
gave rise to the concept of the macrocosm and the microcosm, the large world and the small world. And these two were bound together by sympathies which could not be broken. These combinations went on forever. And every creature in its own way of life, in its own little cycles, long or short, had to go through the cycle of the great year in the universe around them. Now, as, as Homer points out in the Cave of the Nymphs, uh, with Aries at the top point in this cycle, then the vernal equinox at that time was said to occur in Cancer, which was the next important point. Then the summer solstice took place in Libra, and the autumnal equinox in Capricorn. Now, this made the universe into a kind of temple, and it resulted in what are now known as circumambulations. In, in nearly all religions, including Christianity, there are certain rites of walking, so walking around an altar, or in the area around a building, or on a kind of balcony around a sacred center. And the, uh, the uh, place of circumambulation is still retained in practically all European cathedrals. But this circumambulation was really the story of the sun walking around the zodiac, going from one degree to another and bringing in each case certain basic and fundamental changes. Now, in this particular phase of the matter, we find the solar mystery uh, very much adapted to other forms of thought. In every case, practically, the supreme deity was a light deity, a deity of life, light, beauty, and truth. The opposite of this were, were the so-called evil spirits that lived in darkness. In India, the light spirits are called suras, and the dark spirits are called asuras. And light and darkness were always locked in a conflict, a conflict as to which should dominate whether light or darkness would control or rule the conduct of the individual. And, of course, this conflict went right into the individual himself, the light and dark parts of his own nature. The light parts were his hopes and aspirations. The dark parts were his selfishness, his aggressions, and all the negative attitudes which he permitted uh, to f flourish within himself. It was assumed that every evil thing was dark, the reason being that in darkness, uh, the evil has to represent ignorance. Nothing, is, nothing that is wise is dark. This has nothing to do with the appearance of physical structure of the individual, but has to do with the inner construction of his life. Wherever light rules that person, he is light. Where darkness is allowed to go uncorrected and no effort is made to improve oneself, then the darkness is there. And darkness is selfishness, it is self-centeredness, it is corruption, and it is all of the evils which have afflicted, afflicted man since the beginning of his existence. So the uh, light and dark situation now portends. And we know that every year at the winter solstice, the sun god is born. In the temples that were built in Greece, Egypt, India, China, and many other places, the symbolism of the solar system was built into the architecture so that it was there in every case. The Temple of Solomon, the mysterious uh, temples of India and China were all, like the Cathedral of Christianity, solar symbols. And in these solar symbols, as in the Greek mysteries, the human being himself now plays the role of the sun. In other words, the, uh, the year of the sun becomes the symbol of the life of the individual. The individual, so to say, psychologically at least, is born at the winter solstice. He comes into his growth or embodiment at the vernal equinox. He attains the maximum at the parting of the ways at Libra, and he goes on into age until he reaches Capricorn. And these are nine spokes of a wheel. And the uh, so-called broken wheel in religious symbolism is the wheel with nine spokes and three broken ones. In man, the generational structure is that the prenatal epoch 
It consists of nine solar months. Therefore, man is born of the broken wheel. For furthermore, of course, the ancients said that man coming to true birth must pass through nine months in the womb of his mother and three months in the womb of the temple. In other words, the year was completed by three initiatory degrees by which the individual came into his own maturity. The individual was born uh, with three quarters of the circle. The other quarter of the circle had to be earned. And the th three degrees of this earning have been perpetuated in most of the religious and mystical organizations of the world from the beginning. So the individual, to perfect his life, must pass through the experiences which are indicated uh, by this solar system structure. Homer tells us, for instance, that souls coming into birth entered through the sign of cancer, and at that time they drank of the cup of mimesomy, of forgetfulness, and forgot all else but what the, but what was coming in in the future. They then descended through Leo, Virgo, to Libra, and Libra was a pair of scales, and the Libra scales is the psychostasia of Egypt, the weighing of the soul. It is the dividing point between the involutionary and evolutionary march of the soul through the zodiac. Having attained uh, this balance and having been tested, the soul then begins to emerge from the chrysalis of its material existence. And from the time it enters Libra to the time it reaches Capricorn, it is advancing toward enlightenment. At Capricorn, it comes to the gate of exit from the body. The cancer is the entrance to the cave. Capricorn is the exit. And therefore, the cave is embodiment, incarnation, and establishment in the material universe. In Capricorn, the individual comes to the end of material existence. Therefore, we almost always represent the sign of Capricorn, as an old man with a scythe walking with a tiny child that has just been born. This symbolism is derived directly from the ancient mysteries and the rites that were a part of it in very remote times. Therefore, that Capricorn, the individual, theoretically departs from this life or under the mysteries of initiation, departs from materiality. Not, the signs from Cancer around uh, to Capricorn represent materiality. Here we have the individual has to pass through all of the labors of the Her Hercules, who performs twelve labors, or Sindad the sailor, who makes twelve journeys, or wherever the twelve comes into the pattern, we are dealing with the zodiac. Then uh, when it comes to Capricorn, the individual regains his lost memory and emerges from the cave into the clear atmosphere above. Now, when you look at the zodiac in this way and you place Aries at the top, then you realize that Aquarius and Pisces are between Capricorn and the re reunion with deity. These represent, and found in the old symbolism, the experiences of the consciousness in the development of its extrasensory perceptions. Aquarius becomes the symbol of the great innovation of, of true knowledge, the great dedication. And in astrology, it is the house of the friends, friendship. In the mysteries, it was the symbol of universal citizenship, in which the individual now becomes a part of the universal mystery. And Pisces is the symbol of illumination or the esoteric fulfillment of the journey, and thus it goes completely around the, the wheel. The first two signs, after Aries, Taurus and Gemini, are not involved in embodiment, but they are involved in the, in the order, in the uh, superphysical aspect of the universe. Because the five signs, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, belong to the invisible world of causes from which the soul descends into embodiment. 
and from the time it is en enters embodiment to the time when it casts off the body, it remains um, and obscured. It remains concealed from its own identity. It must struggle in darkness. Now, in the mystery system, this is a point of great importance because from the time the entity enters through the gate of cancer or birth to the time when it exits again through Capricorn, it is in a world which is strange to it. It is in a world in which it is being tested for its own immortality. Not that the immortality is threatened, but because until the soul has made this journey, it cannot be tr safely entrusted with the great truths of life. This is the place or the uh, sphere of learning. And the learning must be gradually based upon one factor only, only internal integrities. In the lower hemisphere the, of darkness or of uh, ignorance, there is no great light available. Almost all of us recognize now the failure of materialism. Well, the lower half of the great circle is the sphere of materialism. Materialism is the ethical darkness. It is the darkness which has resulted from man turning from the ways of light or refusing to light the darkness by his own conduct. The labor of the individual, therefore, is to bring light into darkness. First, the light coming in himself from his own darkness, and then later bestowing light upon the whole world which is in darkness. Therefore, the great teachers are the light bearers who must bring light and hope to the dark uh, semicircle of the, of the lower half of the zodiac. Now, in, the, in getting into this, then, we find what we know today to be true, that we live in the material world which is a world of uncertainties. Our facts are very few. Our convictions are numerous and conflicting. We do not, any of us, have the answers to the ultimate. And we are not going to have those answers given to us. We must release them from within ourselves. Therefore, in this hemisphere of darkness, each individual must work out his own salvation with diligence. Those were the last words of the Buddha. We must, each of us, find the light according to our own integrities. To do this, we must have dedication. And this dedication is, whether we realize it or not, bestowed by birth itself. From that time on, we must develop this dedication by personal effort. We must resist every day those forces and conditions which perpetuate darkness. And darkness is always lack of the final form of light, ethics, or the uh, recognition of the essential values of integrities. If the individual goes along this pathway, he comes, as in the Egyptian ritual, finally into the great hall of the twin truths in Amentet, the abode of the great god Osiris. Now, Osiris has as a symbol an eye, and that eye, of course, is the sun. And this eye represents the sun of the underworld. When the individual is in the lower half of the zodiac, the only sun that can shine into his life is from within himself. He must gradually release the great light that was bestowed upon him in heaven or in the divine worlds. In the meantime, if he comes into the hall of Amentet. He, st he stands before Osiris who wears the plumes of the north and south, that is, the plumes of the spiritual and material halves of the zodiac. The, the crown of Osiris is inclined exactly to the degree of the solar axis at the present time. In other words, the ancients knew the inclination of the axis. This... Uh, uh, deity then becomes the judge of the quick and the dead. And this deity is the sun in its karmic aspect. The soul of the deceased person is represented by a symbol. And this soul goes into the presence of Osiris to be judged. 
to be weighed in the balance. And we have here a very interesting series of symbolical rituals, which can be mentioned briefly. First of all, the uh, court of Osiris in the underworld is the place for the assessors or the judges. And this was the, or and this was the origin of the present jury system where the individual is judged, either vil, uh, victorious or defeated, by a jury of his peers. In addition to the juries, which uh, sit at the upper end of the great papyrus symbols on the scrolls of the Book of the Dead, there comes forward the defender, the public defender. In this case, the public defender is the one and only son of Osiris born posthumously after his father's death, therefore called the son of the widow. And this deity, Horus, with the eyes of the solar hawk, stands before his father and asks leniency for the soul under judgment. And, if the, and as the trial proceeds, this uh, leniency becomes, in a sense, uh, the fact that Osiris' son is going to carry the guilt of the person if he cannot survive the test by his own strength. Then the weighing of the soul takes place, and on one end of the, ba of the balance is the feather of the law, Mayat, and on the other end is a little vase containing the heart of the dead person. And the dead person's heart cries out in, uh, in the ritual, let me not perish with the body that dies in a day. Therefore, the uh, soul asks for uh, consideration and forgiveness. The uh, prosecuting attorney is in the form of Typhon, the mysterious water, water beast of the Egyptians, a creature combining in symbolism the attributes of a, of a hippopotamus and an alligator. This is the one that is to receive the soul if it is not able to go on to the better life. And of course to the Egyptians the meaning was very obvious. This, ma this uh, creature that swallows up the imperfect soul is re-embodiment. If it doesn't pass it must come back. In the meantime the, the balance is made and uh, uh, Horus, the son, pleads with his father, interceding for the uh, soul of the person who is passed on. And then because uh, uh, Horus is the only begotten son of his father, his father is lenient to the world through his son and forgives the soul and permits it to go in peace. It's a very interesting ritual and has been found in one form or another throughout the whole world. Now, as the uh, scene continues, the, we know that Libra is the sign of the balance. We know that it is the place where the path breaks between going forward and failing to go forward. At every case, in every case, there comes the time when the journey downward into sorrow and fear comes to an end because the soul has achieved a victory over its own weaknesses. It is then weighed in the balance. And if the balance balances, it then goes on into the upper cycles. And this is the reason for the sign of Libra, the scales, being exactly opposite the sign of Aries, which is the symbol of the great uh, winter power. This uh, uh, symbolism then goes on and we find that the human being is the solar symbol. The human being is the creature that must make the circle of the zodiac inside of itself, not out in the world, but it must perform the twelve labors, and through the performance of the twelve labors, prove that it is ready and worthy to receive enlightenment. So we follow then the it's time when the sun moves northward. The sun moves northward beginning at the winter solstice. And here it is for the first time 
starting out on a new journey. Now, the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Hindus all knew that the sun wasn't actually born at the, win at the winter solstice. It was, in a sense, reborn annually. It had, it had to come back each year to the beginning of a new cycle of existence and experience. Therefore, an embodiment was a new cycle, but not a true beginning from antiquity. So for from the beginning, the soul, the soul moves gradually northward to produce at the vernal equinox the mystery of spring. And the mystery of spring was also very heavily believed by practically all peoples of antiquity. It was the symbol of the coming of the new fertility. That which was uh, conceived in Aries is born into material life in Cancer. And, of course, the uh, sign of cancer is always the vernal equinox, and this occurs uh, whenever the time is necessary and right. This is when the uh, soul enters into embodiment. Now, the vernal equinox follows... Now, this is with Aries in the midheaven, not with uh, Aries on the eastern horizon. The uh, time of Easter is therefore the great symbol of the resurrection of the dying God. Uh, the ancient light promise is, is fulfilled, for it was believed in the ancients that the coming of the vernal equinox was the proof of the pact between God and man, that at this time, if this equinox occurred, it was because the whole world had a new lease on life a new opportunity to perfect itself, a new chance to be truly wise and good. And if the world didn't end in a terrible conflagration at the vernal equinox, then man's hopes were fulfilled. He was to be given another opportunity to perfect and unfold his own nature. So the vernal equinox was the time of promise. It was the time of resurrection. It was the time when the earth was broken, and the little seeds came out. It was the time where the old mystics in Europe celebrated the feast of the mustard seed, the little seed that was very small, the heart, which was from some time to be a great tree that would shade the universe. be a great tree that would shade the universe. So the uh, beginning of the new opportunity for regeneration was the resurrection of the sun god at the vernal equinox. Now this was carried over into theology and brought into contact with many different legends and myths in all parts of the world. But in every one of these different systems, the actual s sense of the matter was that the human being in his own growth passes from conception to birth, and in passing from conception to birth fulfills the first part of his journey. He then is born, and the birth, the physical birth, is the beginning of the journey through the chambers of initiation. It is at that point that the entity begins to unfold the potential. Here the, the, the small twig of Arcacia is revealed. It is shown that the life is there, <clears throat> that the, in the winter it appeared to die, but it was not dead, it sleepeth, and it comes forth again. And in the life of every individual, when sorrow, misery, destruction, evil things plague the life, make it seem very difficult, by quiet contemplation of realities, we all discover that there is in us the, sh the germ of an immortality that cannot perish, but that when we really desire and start a conscious journey towards truth, at that moment the little seed in the, within ourselves begins to build the inner life for us. The seed, of, the seed becomes the tree of the soul, as it was called by Bemi. So we've gone start out on all the problems and processes of life. 
and we are not shown what to do or told exactly. We have the experience of our ancestors. We have three great directives to help us. One of these directives is observation, to see what is happening in the world. Another directive is experimentation, to try a thing and see if it works. The third one is tradition, the gift we receive as a legacy from our ancestors who have passed through all kinds of experiences and problems. If we are able to use these three instruments, they will guide us or guide the sun from the vernal equinox to the summer solstice. It will then bring into play all of the labors of life, for it is from the time of the planting to the time of the harvest that the individual must guard his properties, must sacrifice his time and energy to protect the crop which he has planted. The farmer, therefore, is most busy in those months in which it is necessary for him to prepare for the harvest that is to come. Therefore, in life, young people must prepare for the harvest of the years. Those starting out must build for the future. And in each instance, the, the great uh, supreme power to achieve that which is most necessary or most desired lies in the dedication of the individual to the principles of his religion. Actually, therefore, the ancients didn't have religions just the way we have them. They didn't have so much formalization. Most religions of antiquity were religions of joy. There were very few sorrows in the religions of ancient peoples because they believed so firmly in the reality of good that they even accepted troubles and tragedies as testings of good, of, of means of strengthening. Adversity tempers the steel of the human soul, making it strong in emergencies. And the old peoples of the worlds of long ago accepted many of the problems that we reject simply because they realized they were part of life. So in this part of the testimony, we go back again to the temples and we find that the disciples take these initiatory vows and begin the journey through the three primary degrees of initiation. And the sun does the same thing in the three primary degrees between the testing of the soul and the entry of the uh, cycle, the sun cycle, into Capricorn. Here we find three definite efforts made to prepare the individual for the three great steps that he must take later. Here he is supposed to conquer the three parts of himself which are subject to the stress of initiation, the body, the heart, and the mind. But the body, he must discipline the flesh until it becomes uh, serviceable as an instrument to give it all care that is necessary. No legitimate system of ancient religion ever tormented or tortured the body for purification. It, it was simplified. All the luxuries might be eliminated, but it was necessary to protect the body because it was the contact with the world of experience, and without that, the great trip could not be successfully made. After the body was obedient to the will and to the heart, then the second step was the purification of the emotions and the heart. Here the individual had to generate a new discipline upon the emotional life of himself. He must purify his affections. He must control his appetites. He must have all kinds of hope and, and a positive and constructive emotions. He must gradually overcome criticism. He must cure the causes of neuroses and things of this nature. So that actually uh, the second step in the three steps was to gain control of all pressures which arise through, through illusion and fantasy within the life of the person. Then the third step consisted of the purification of the mind. The mind so that it could be no longer uh, a problem to the life of the person. The purification of thought included, of course, complete overcoming of selfishness, self-interest, pride, all of the arrogances and all of the worldly values which many people cling to so tenaciously. In other words, the mind must be detached from everything which will not survive after the body dies. 
we are to take with us in the mind only that which is not dependent upon the body, but is dependent upon the insight of the individual himself. Now, having accomplished these three labors over these three signs, the individual uh, has become uh, gradually cleared of some of the problems which we face today, because in these recent times we have lost contact almost entirely with this concept. We are no longer in the position uh, to understand just what all this adds up to. But one thing we do know is that gradually so-called progress has, gra has destroyed the integrity of millions and millions of people. We are no longer able or willing uh, to use the body and the physical embodiment for the improvement of nature, for the strengthening of character, for the extensions of knowledge, and through the birth and rebirth within ourselves of those elements and factors and parts which are necessary to our perfection. We have therefore gradually changed our father's house into a place of merchandise. We have taken it and we have disfigured the entire purpose of evolution. We have failed to recognize the real, real reason for the gift of the sacred year. For a year is a period set aside for the growth of beings. It has something to do every year in repeating and repeating the evidence of what is necessary. The year becomes the great teacher of each person if that person will be observant of what happens during the months of that year. He will also gradually come to recognize that the uh, loss of the memory of the past at cancer when he enters the gates of oblivion is this loss is restored to him at Capricorn. And as he brings his life into perfect order, the whole pattern of his life will be revealed again. He will remember, whereas previously he forgot. Previously he forgot his, huma his divinity and remembered only the humanity that was being born in him. At Capricorn, he is no longer locked into the memory of material things but restores his memory of the divine world from which he came. So the uh, year is a, is a very great symbol of things, a symbol that we all could do something about. If, however, we imagine for a moment that uh, this whole pattern, of this astral theology, does have a meaning that is more profound than we realize, we know that it was protected in one way or another so that the human being who was not prepared to receive it would not be likely to gain a knowledge which would damage him. But now everything has more or less changed. The old systems have gone away. There are still traces of them, and some very good older systems still function. But for the most part, people today have no consideration for the consequences of action, and they have no realization of indebtedness to the universe, a debt which must be paid by conduct. While this condition remains as it is, we have some of the great tragedies of life. At some time in the remote past, for example, uh, science, which was in the hands of uh, a very exclusive group, not exclusive in the sense of snobbish, but exclusive in the sense of knowing, informed, and morally incorruptible. The, this knowledge was placed in the keeping of persons who had already forsworn all personal advantage, who had, all, <coughs> had already forsworn any action for profit that was contrary to principle, and, were, and had accepted the obligation that everything that man discovers must be brought to the altar of God. Now, as a result of this type of dis disagreement and a dis discourtesy at the moment, we can take a little look at science. Here we have probably one of the most valuable instruments the world has ever been given, an instrument by, uh, bounded and founded in the great s s triad of mathematics, astronomy, and music. Science which has developed itself in many, many ways and has given us a great number of very pleasant privileges 
and has made life easier for millions of people, and in this respect has gained our confidence. But we begin to notice something. We notice that the scientist has not taken the obligations that were given in the ancient mysteries. He has not forsworn fame. He has not declared that he will invent only that which will serve good. He does not permit his secrets to be carried out if he is properly informed, if they will bring damage or injury to any other living thing. So what is happening? We have a scientific world which has given us much to be grateful for, but might sometime give us that which will extinguish all the good that science has ever given. This is the type of thing that was a great concern to the ancients, that they will prevent the abuse of the greater knowledge that gradually comes to the human being. This greater knowledge was therefore protected by the rites of initiation, the basic rites of three degrees, by means of which it was possible for the person, representing again the embodiment of the sun, uh, to become morally responsible. So in the first degree of the ancient rites were given the first primary purifications. Purification in the mystery system uh, was only symbolized by baptism because the real purification was not given by water. It was given by the divine power of deity itself. But in this first step, the mind, the heart, and the body were cleansed of selfishness and self-interest. The individual became as a little child seeking truth, realizing that the things around him which he has assumed to be truth are not necessarily true. Many things that we believe are not so. Many things that we disbelieve will ultimately be proven to be true. And in this mystery of uncertainties, it is very much to our advantage to place certain disciplines upon our own attitudes. We may not know yet why we should do it or how we should make these applications, but that something has to happen inside the individual before it is safe to bestow upon him the wisdom of his race is more or less obvious. There is a great body of wisdom and there is a great race of people who have found it, built it, created systems for the uh, perpetuation of it, but have never applied it to their own lives. They have never done those things in themselves which can make them safe custodians of the future. In the ancient mystery rites, the Pythagoreans, for example, the Master told the disciples very definitely that every, every disciple who went forth to teach in his turn must do everything possible to find a successor. This successor must be a person who, whom he has instructed um, or has found to be adequately instructed, and only to the person who already has earned the right can the master bestow the mantle of his leadership. And if by any chance he passes out of this life without finding a disciple that is worthy, that is itself part of the necessary lesson. Therefore, to pass on any knowledge in which there is a power to injure until a person has proven that he is no longer capable of injuring, anything else is dangerous. And it was this kind of ethics of, of building uh, knowledge into a qualified group that we have known in ancient rites. Now, some people hold these ancient rites to be snobbish, selfish, and that these leaders have intentionally uh, concealed truth because they wanted to govern other people or wanted to be masters over slaves. History has no strength for that support at all. It is no, there is no effort to recognize or no opportunity to prove or no way of proving that those who truly possess great knowledge were the ones who were the cause of trouble. The ones who are the cause of trouble are those who want to resist knowledge and gain authority by uh, allowing people to be less than they should be. 
Therefore, that which wishes to be popular, first of all, makes a virtue out of things that are not true. And as a result of that, everyone is worse off. Now, in the uh, initiation rites, as they were given, the first degree is that of purification. The second degree is that of service. Uh, the first degree, the individual tries to clean the inside of his own cup. The second degree, he is dedicated to the service of some need or some person uh, in, in his environment or for whom he has responsibility. A servant, in this sense of the word, may go out and become a, a leader of peoples in the right direction, may become a clergyman or a priest or also an instructor, a teacher, a, a guide to other people. Or, in the same spirit and in the same light, he may serve only in his own house. He may serve his family. He may serve relatives who are ill. He will go out and protect his children. He will sacrifice his own profit and his own pleasure to the security of his family. He will be unselfish in his use of possessions, gentle and kindly and forbearing in his dealings with those around him. This is the simple sign. One individual may go out and rule a country. The other may stay home and rule himself and his family justly, lovingly, and wisely. Both are fulfilling the same requirement. Both are therefore servants of principles greater than those of ordinary commitments. After that comes the third step in which the veil of the temple is opened to allow the, the uh, professed uh, person uh, to begin to gain the, the full meaning of what he has gone through. In the third step, the individual receives that amount of instruction that is necessary for him at the moment given. He is then given the keys to use certain knowledge which was previously denied him. Now, in the, the idea that this knowledge comes simply from another person is, is not quite true either. The actual fact is that if the person is purified in his inner life, dedicated to the needs of others, the next thing that he needs will be revealed to him by his own conduct. He will discover that which he needs next because he needs it. But if he is not ready for it, he seeks for it in vain. And the idea that he can find something he doesn't deserve is not supported in the old systems. It is that he must deserve before the truth can be given to him. And if he gains what appears to be truth without deserving it, it will ultimately end in deceit and destruction. So those were the three steps that the average person has to follow, just as the sun has to follow. It goes from its birth uh, to its point of greatest restoring and resurrecting power. It passes from there to the time when it goes to harvest, and then it goes into the silence of winter. Now, what is the silence of winter in relationship to this mystery cycle? Is it really uh, an evil thing? Uh, not according to the old rites, it isn't. Winter might be considered the, is the great Sabbath. It is the time of rest. It is the time in which all things which have passed through experience are rewarded by rest and repose. Winter is the time of peacefulness within. It is the time where the individual no longer has to labor, but has to rest for a time before he goes forth on another cycle. In other words, in the terms of the men and women of the desert, the winter is the cavansary, the place of rest and repose, where the individual who has completed the cycle of life has an opportunity to prepare for further life. Well, the ancients held that under that heading also came what was termed digestion. This is an alchemical term that is very interesting and has great significance for us. Digestion means that having passed through a series of experiences, it is necessary for the individual to summarize what he has accomplished. It is necessary to transform an experience into 
an, an awakening of inner value. The individual has had a life with many problems. He has had many different decisions to make. And in uh, the Pythagorean discipline of retrospection, he goes back over the years of his life to find out what he has really learned, to know what mistakes he has made, and also how he corrected those that he discovered. He finds out how the weaknesses of his own character are still holding him back. He discovers where little germs of self-centeredness have prevented certain magnificent facts from being manifested fully to him. In retrospection in the Pythagorean school was usually given at night or just before bed as the sleep. And that in the uh, great solar cycle, this retrospection is part of the cycle of winter. This cycle of winter is a, a very interesting phenomenon because we know very little about it, except everything seems to go to rest or go to sleep. And uh, there are a few things, however, like the evergreen, which was among ancient peoples always the symbol of immortality, and therefore the Christmas tree, that in this phase of the situation, the soul comes to a temporary condition of after-death awareness. It is not judged by something else. It is judged by itself. There is a recapitulation, as is also referred to in uh, some cases, where it is said the person's in desperate condition in this world, in drowning or something of this nature, see their whole life go before them again in reverse order. This is to a great degree the same principle involved, except in the after-death state. There is no judgment, there is no punishment, except what the individual bestows upon himself in the reviewing of his own conduct. He is not whipped by some evil spirit. He is not damned by an avenging deity. He is simply detached from body to contemplate what he has learned while embodied, which will help him to be unembodied forever. This is the, uh, the situation more or less as it stands. The individual must finally become his own judge and jury. And this is possible because of the deity that abides within himself. He is judged by himself. But he is judged no longer with the modifications of his personal interests and desires. He is not judged because he wants to do this or wants to do that. And he cannot say, I'm sorry, but that was the way it was then. He has to face the exact fulfillment of his previous life. He has to realize what he did was right and what was not right. And for those who have had a very miserable existence with very little discipline, the experience will probably be a little humbling. But never evil, never corrupt. Never a terrible pain, but rather a deep realization of failure. But always in the realization of failure, the promise of ultimate fulfillment. So that uh, in this, in the dark part of the winter, we find the loneliness of that uh, which is the human state. Every human being is in a sense alone and will always be lonely until it can be restored to the eternity which is its proper nature. So that in the winter, the individual becomes uh, a little bit aware of the necessity of fulfilling his own winter. And, and lots of elderly people look back upon a very constructive and useful life they're pretty well satisfied that they've done it as good as they could do it. And when they're unbodied, then they will also have a clearer vision of what it all meant. Very often the individual can only say, well, I, I did sacrifice myself because I felt it was necessary. But this isn't the real message. The real message is found only when the inner life itself, freed from body, estimates the values and merits of its own accomplishments. And very often these accomplishments are better than we think. 
and very often these accomplishments cause the simple person to be given precedence by his own conduct over those who seem to be much more advanced than himself. After this experience of winter comes again the problem of a new spring of life. And in this experience, the soul goes to sleep again. And after going through this particular experience, the soul begins to fade. It goes into a kind of de a deep rest, a repose. <coughs> and you will find that in studying various books dealing with these subjects, there is really very seldom any dis description or any discussion of the interval between embodiments. We have uh, long assumed, of course, that this interval was filled with compensations and punishments and so forth. But let's realize for once and for all that all of these things are internal. That the individual in the interval does have a communion with themselves. They are not surrounded by fork-tailed demons. They are not punished forever. They are not lost. They are not lost souls. They are people who are trying to explain to themselves the mistakes they made last time and making resolutions not to make them again. In other words, it is a quiet self-contemplation. Now, if a person has committed some very serious fault or some very evil deed, then in this clear atmosphere of realization, this of sudden experience of a larger existence than the person ever realized in the material world, there can be some serious repentance. There can be a realization of the great mistake that was made, and also perhaps a dedication of some kind uh, to remedy that mistake in any way possible. In other words, the individual is born into this life, again through the gate of cancer, not just simply as a brand new little infant, but as a person or a being that has learned something by an after-death cycle, and that this learning must be incorporated into the new embodiment. This learning must become part of what is brought forward into the new incarnation. And it is the nature of things that each incarnation should be a little improvement over the one that came before. <coughs> so we have the inter inter uh, interval uh, bringing the person back with a personality, with an integration of their own. Each of individual is the sum of his own mistakes and also the sum of his, sum of his own accomplishments. He comes back midstream in a great cycle of unfoldment. He comes forward with various degrees of achievement. And very often, the more advanced his degrees of achievement, the more simple his life will be here. Wise people do not wish to burden themselves with those excesses which contribute to temptation and misery. Therefore, those who have a deep understanding will probably live a simple life but they will also have certain experiences which they will f confront again. If, if necessary, they will be placed in a difficult family situation which they must solve because they didn't solve it before. Another one may find uh, heavy emphasis upon honesty because he has corrected, because he has not corrected his dishonesty in a previous life. Appetites also have very strong karmic consequences, <coughs> and moral delinquencies are punished seriously. The individual must gradually uh, realize that these punishments are in himself, that he wanted them, he needed them, he had to have them, but the moment he is embodied, he doesn't want them. So it is only between incarnations that he really gets a good look at himself. That is the time when the facts of life are most evident and normally available to him. And all these facts that, that, that apply to him are within the pattern of his own existence. He is not responsible to the patterns of other people. He is not responsible for anything except his own relationship with truth, and relationship which he is gradually building. 
as he goes further and further in this structural development, he will find out finally what his purpose is. And he will probably discover what the Egyptians decided it was, namely, that in due time this person will be in fact the very thing which is now his miniature existence. He will become a sun. He will become a great center of light. He will be a center of light in his family sometime. He will be a center of light in his country. He will be a center of light in the world and become one of the great teachers of mankind. And then he will go on beyond this. He will be go on into the consciousness of planets and suns and space. He will go, he will be growing forever until in each of us the entire universal purpose is fulfilled. Therefore, the uh, daily journey and the time it takes is a very inconsiderable thing. We will find as we go along that uh, the journey that we are really making goes on for hundreds of lives. It goes on but never twice the same. We never pay for something we didn't do. We never fail to get the reward of what we have done well. But these rewards are in terms of soul growth, not in terms of material circumstances. And as the individual goes further and further into the mystery of the soul world, or the world of soul, he will find that his citizenship there is far more important than his success or failures in this life. But we are all getting a little better. We are all growing. Sometimes a bad mistake is one of the most powerful forces for growth because it suddenly brings us face to face with ourselves. We find that uh, things like uh, alcoholism, narcotics addictions, and things of this nature become a great burden upon the soul. But the soul learns to uh, overcome them. And in the overcoming, it gains a strength otherwise impossible to it. So everywhere, every time, always, the growth is going on to the best of the ability of the human being to perform growth. So in this way, the sun becomes a kind of master plan, which by coming around each time begins to bring a cycle of experiences to nature. Each year the sun comes back to the world. Each year the world is just a little different. Each year the sun performs a slightly different service. And over the period of ages, these services vary greatly. But in all cases, nature continues to produce this solar cycle. The sun, in order that it may fulfill its own purpose, the sun is the cleanser, the purifier, the illuminator. And it will come every time to, to carry on this particular task. Sometimes it will find a dark world waiting for it, heavily burdened with its own errors. Sometimes it will come to a better world where things seem right. But always the sun in its cycle is working towards the one great end. And that great end, of course, is the final illumination of all that exists that all the things in themselves and by themselves and for themselves shall be fulfilled or be perfect in their needs and in their operations. Thus we can find in the old sacred books how often the sun deities are called by names that are more or less solar. How we find in every mythology the legend of the dying God. We find forever the mystery of the resurrection through dedication. And we also learn that in this world, gradually, happiness and security come from inward disciplines and dedications. That the individual who disciplines life to the best of his ability is gaining ground. The individual who is gradually weeding out his own selfishness is gradually correcting his own intensities, who is gaining control of his emotions, and who is no longer able to injure others merely to the satisfaction of his own temperament. As these factors fade out and the life is smoothed out as a quiet, gentle, growing towards reality. If it does this and we are able to make it work in this way, we will find that every life time has its importance. 
Now, uh, those who are already part way through one of, one of these lives, as we all are, uh, has, has much to be grateful for. Many people between the middle life and the terminal years do go through a certain period of mental reorganization. Uh, Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, makes special notice of this. How people gradually, as they get older, become more and more aware of the universal and less and less bound to the local situations of living. Little by little, we get rid of the things that we don't need. We pass on to others what they want and we no longer want. And it becomes more and more obvious that for the long journey, it is best to travel light. And uh, therefore, we dispose of ballast. We do not want it, because gradually we find that the things we love the most uh, are not going to be permanent. We're going not to have them anyway, so we find ways of getting rid of them. But while that, that is true, that inside of ourselves, which is permanent growth, becomes more obvious every day. Permanent growth makes us happier, richer, and better equipped for the great cycles of life that lie before us. And actually, every time we come into the world, the sun moves northward and brings to us opportunities for growth. But most of all, the light, which is the internal and invisible sun, is bringing to ripeness and to fulfillment the harvest of pressures, powers, and, and, and values locked within ourselves as the sun produces the symbol of the sprouting of the seed, so the light within ourselves produces the ripening of all the inner values of consciousness. And the sun which brings the harvest to the earth, it brings as a light to the mind and hearts of human beings, so that they may too have the harvest of their years and have a great and <coughs> wonderful future. It all works out, and I think the vision of it, as it was sensed and held and believed by the ancients, is kind of worthwhile to give a little thought to at this season of the year. Thank you very much.